Hello and a warm welcome to another conversation about books which comes to you courtesy of the wonderful bookstore at Regent College in Vancouver. Today it's great to be talking to Professor John Swinton about his new book, Finding Jesus in the Storm, The Spiritual Lives of Christians with Mental Health Challenges and it's published by Erdmans, Finding Jesus in the Storm. John, many thanks for joining us. Oh, pleasure. John Swinton is Professor of Practical Theology and Pastoral Care at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, a place that's very dear to my own heart. And he's researched and written extensively on issues of mental health, disability and spirituality. As befits a Professor of Practical Theology, John is far from being an unengaged theorist on these matters. In Finding Jesus in the Storm, he writes that my horizon emerges from my life history which traverses three professions, psychiatric nurse, ordained minister, and practical theologian. So John, before we start digging into your book, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your personal journey and this very interesting combination of professions, uh, which is clearly so relevant to your academic work and your writing. Yeah, well, I have had a kind of unusual uh, career. So I began my life, uh, well I actually began my life as a scientist. I worked for a year as an assistant scientific officer but then I got bored with that. Uh, and then I, then I drove a van for a while, for a year. And I really enjoyed that, that was great. Because you know, the th nice thing about that job was that at the end of the day you're finished. Then you go back and do your, your finishing. You know the problem with the kind of work that I do now is you never get finished. And so you're, it's always in your head. So I enjoyed that. But then I, I, I said I didn't want to do that forever, so I, I trained as a psychiatric nurse. And I worked in nursing for a total of 16 years, originally in mental health, and then I retrained and worked in the area of what over here is called learning disability, I think internationally it's called uh, uh, intellectual disability. Um, and then I decided that I was going to go to university and I, wanted, I was going to train as a, I thought originally I was going to train as a chaplain, but as soon as I got to university I knew that I wanted to teach practical theology. Which was rather odd because the first class that I had in practical theology was basically, uh, you could sum it up by saying, don't throw stones at coffins, which basically meant that uh, if you're doing a funeral, make sure there are no stones in the earth that you throw into the grave, otherwise it rattles and upsets people. And so practical theology in these days was handy household hints for ministers. Um, but even on that first day, I knew that's what I wanted to do. So I think I found my vocation on that moment. Uh, and thankfully, practical theology has changed a bit since then. And so I got a job down in Glasgow lecturing uh, once I finished my PhD. Then I came back up to Aberdeen and I've been here for 22 years now. Yeah, a lifetime. Yeah. So, I mean, when you were... Uh... When you were a nurse, a psychiatric nurse, and uh, you know, and then a, a nurse with the, the folks with the learning disabilities, I mean, did you um, were you conscious of kind of collecting material theologically, as it were? I mean, did you did you have in mind that that kind of move into um, a kind of a chaplaincy role and uh, beyond that into academia? No, I've never had a plan. I think just I just kind of things just happen to me in life. I, I, so I don't tend to plan ahead in that sense. I mean, I, I, looking back, I can see there is a plan, but I, I'm not. I don't really. I've never had a career plan in that sense. So when I was nursing, although I was being shaped and formed by the experience, because you know, you're, 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 I was all. I realized, and looking back, I was always with people who saw the world differently. You know, people with mental health challenges or people with intellectual disabilities, and that shapes and forms the way that you see things, the way you understand things. And so when I came into theology, uh, I, all of that experience was then available to me to be, begin to think about you know, how do I understand this theologically, uh, which probably enables me to ask slightly different questions than a normal academic would, would do, simply because I've got a different experience, because all theology is done according to the experience that you have. You know, you bring something of yourself, no matter where you are, to your theology, even if it's just your choice of theologian. Uh, and that experience shaped and formed the types of questions that uh, particularly around theological anthropology and what it means to be a human being uh, uh, was I couldn't have done the things I'd done without that experience so it was very formative in that way but I, I wasn't I didn't kind of I wasn't wondering about with the notebook at that time but looking back I, I can certainly it's, it's been invaluable yeah 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 and I mean even the choice of, of, of psychiatric 
psychiatric nursing rather than kind of general nursing um, right at the beginning there. That, that must have been something very um, uh, kind of um, particularly interesting about that choice. Well, it's a personality thing, I think. Because my, my wife is a, a, a general nurse, or a registered nurse, and she considers herself to be a real nurse. Um, for, she, she considers mental health nurses to be uh, certainly nurses, but not in the same way, because what they do is talk to one another and they, they, they relate to one another in a different way. And so psychiatric nursing meets my personality. You know, I'm, I'm curious, I, I quite like being with people and I, I enjoy the kind of atmosphere in a, in a mental health hospital, whereas I wouldn't enjoy and didn't enjoy very much the kind of atmosphere in a more general task oriented hospital. So it was really more to do with personality than anything else that took me into that area of nursing. I mean, I think nursing is probably a good space for me in life, like, but that particular area of nursing is clearly down to, it, it, it fits me as me. And then when you, when you moved into academic theology as opposed to kind of chaplaincy uh, work, I mean, did you specifically intend to reflect theologically on um, issues of concerning ment mental health and disability. I mean, those are the things that you've, you know, you, you've become yeah, known for and, and have specialised in. Yeah, well, when I, I mean, one of the, the good things about Aberdeen uh, in relation to practical theology is they don't have a fixed curriculum. And so what happens, I mean, it's a strength and a weakness, but what tends to happen with practical theology in various places is the area of specialty is brought in by the individual practical theologian they then create a curriculum and they create a research agenda and then they, they do that research and so Aberdeen was very open to me doing whatever I wanted to do in, in that sense as long as it was I was going to say as long as it works but that's not quite the way I mean but as long as it meets the, the academic criteria and as long as people students were getting what they need to get out of it and as long as it fits within practical theology the actual subject matter was, was always left open to me uh, and so the obvious thing for me to do was to reflect on where I've been, to bring these questions and ideas and concepts and life experiences into a theological context and to just ask that basic question, what does all this mean in relation to what we know about God and about human beings? Uh, and so that's, 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 that's the way that that ran. But the, the flexibility, and it's something that, you know, I think it's something, one of the good things with practical theology is it tends to be flexible in that sense. Whereas other disciplines sometimes have a fixed curriculum, then practical theology tends not to do. Now, there's, there's disadvantages in that as well, because it's, it can be very difficult to tie down what a practical theologian is, because everybody does it differently and uses different methods and approaches. But there's a beauty in it uh, uh, from the perspective of the practical theologian, but also from the perspective of the students, because they get information and perceptions and concepts that they wouldn't get otherwise. So uh, complementary, of course, and I don't see that to, to take away from any other discipline, but I think practical theology does bring something important. And in your, in your work on, uh, on mental health, particularly, I mean, you, you're something of a pioneer, really, aren't you? I mean, was it difficult finding other theologians um, to kind of build on, to, to kind of converse with, as it were? Uh, it's not a huge field, is it, really? No. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, different. it's different now, but back then it wasn't. I mean, the first book I, I had published, well, the second book I had published, was called Spirituality and Mental Health Care, and the subtitle was Recovering a Forgotten Dimension. And at that time, it was a forgotten dimension that spirituality and theology, nobody really thought very much about them. It certainly wasn't on the agenda of, of mental health professionals. I went through my whole two trainings, and nobody ever mentioned any of that stuff. Uh, and so at that, at that time, it was pioneer. And then when I did my PhD thesis, which I did on uh, uh, schizophrenia and Christian friendship, it was actually very difficult to find theological sources that spoke directly to the issue. Of course, there's lots of theological sources that you can draw in, and, and, and I did draw them in. But actually, people writing specifically within the area, very few. Thankfully, that's changing now, and it's particularly in the area of spirituality, where there's a lot of research done. Um, uh, but there's still relatively little research done in theology, so there's still spaces there, but it's certainly there's, a, there's been movement. So your book um, is based, I mean, obviously you bring theologians into the conversation and, and, and all kinds of, um, of, of uh, um, theorists about um, uh, mental health, but you've, 
uh, you based it around a series of interviews that you did with uh, Christians who uh, facing live with um, mental health challenges, and these are serious mental health challenges, right? They're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not your kind of, um, you know, ordinary stuff that most of us kind of, um, yeah. kind of, you know, the ups and downs of, of life. So these are serious things. Um, so how did you go about finding those people in the first place? Um, and then, you know, how did you approach the, the conversations with them? That's a great question. Uh, and the, the, on your first point, like, yeah, that's absolutely right. So the people that I was working with, lives with um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression. So they are classified as, as serious mental health challenges. Um, and because one of the things I noticed early on was that when people do talk about um, uh, mental health issues, it, it tends not to be these more difficult ones, more complicated ones. Uh, and even if, even if it, is, it tends to be more clinical than it is theological. So I wanted to try and get into these complicated uh, experiences but from a theological perspective, not discounting the, the clinical, of course. Uh, and so uh, I access them to a variety of, of, of sources um, through uh, personal contact and through what we describe as the snowball effect in qualitative research. So you find somebody who um, shares the experience and then they pass you on to somebody else who shares that experience, who passes you on to, to their experiences uh, through social media. Uh, and through contacts with, with uh, health professional colleagues. So I, I use a variety of different ways to, to find people and people came forward. Uh, and I, I managed to get a lot of people who were really interested in it because people were keen to have their story heard. You know, but they felt that they, they're not able to do that themselves because they, they, they either they don't want to or feel that they, they can't do, but they do think, they feel they've got things to say and important theological things to say. So people, I think, were very open and, and willing to participate. Because, mm. I mean, it's potentially uh, kind of dynamite, isn't it, in terms of interviews with, with people who, you know, they, it, it can be very, very sensitive because you're dealing with such a, a personal thing and a history which also is, is can be extremely painful so i wonder how you approached that i mean how you you you, yeah. you kind of with did you just do a, like a one-off interview or was a series of interviews with the same person yeah well i mean one of the criteria with obviously the whole thing went through our university ethics committee and one of the criteria was that somebody wasn't actively ill at that moment in time and not, not actively receiving uh, for an inpatient um, uh, care at that moment in time um, and so the um, most of the interviews were uh, one-off with uh, the possibility of, of following up with uh, to, for me to check out and to make sure that I had represented people properly and authentically um, and if there was any questions uh, that in, in relation to that what was being said rather than in relation to uh, the implications of what was being said because one of the interesting things in all conversations is you, you say things all the time and um, but sometimes when you hear them back you don't really like them not because they're not true it's just because you don't really like them uh, and so I, I always wanted to check back in terms of accuracy uh, and sometimes people they change their mind about some things and that's absolutely that's absolutely appropriate but for the most part, uh, uh, I think the interviews were accurate in relation to what people meant as well as what they what they said. Um, and so, yes, there was the safeguards. Everybody who was involved was advised to. Uh, we didn't talk well. First of all, we weren't talking about clinical things. We weren't talking about the co the, the reason for their uh, experiences or the causes of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. We were talking specifically about how people experience their spiritual lives during the, their, their, their mental health experiences. So we didn't really, and I consciously didn't get into clinical issues because that would have been inappropriate. That would have been bringing up things from people's past, et cetera. We, we just didn't do that. Um, and it was, it, was, it was made clear from the beginning that wasn't what it was about and people were comfortable with that. So because it was a specific focus that we were at, uh, I, it, it was safe, but people were advised to have someone available uh, if anything popped up that they, they felt that they needed help with afterwards. Mm. One of the major concerns, it seems to me, of the book is to find a, a, the right way of talking about 
these experiences to find the right language for um uh for, for talking about uh, serious mental health challenges um and you i mean this this is some a challenge that kind of goes from the top of the prof the profession if you like um you know the folks who are dealing the, the the mental health professionals um right down to the kind of the person in the street the ordinary person and the way that we, we speak about um uh, mental health issues to particularly to the the christian in the pew and you know the challenges of of how the yeah. church uh, approaches these issues um so i mean the feeling you you, you seem to be basically saying that we, you know so much of the time we get this wrong and you know all of us get this wrong the way we we we're we're approaching this and speaking about it yeah yeah i think that that's fair i mean I, the, the way that i articulate it in the book is that all of us live under some kind of description so we all you know uh, I, I may be described as a university professor or a scots person or you may be described as a welsh person so we, we live under these different types of descriptions, the way people describe th things and describe us. Uh, but the way that we describe something determines what we think we see and what we think we see determines how we respond to what we think we see. So it, description is really, really important. Uh, and to have a diversity of identity that really captures something of who you are, you need to be able to understand and take seriously the, the, the various descriptions that, that you have in your life, you know, as lover, friend. One of, one of the problems for people who live with mental health issues is that they receive a diagnosis and then that diagnosis takes over everything. That becomes a primary description that defines everything about them, everything that they do. Uh, and it, most of that, the assumptions that go behind that diagnosis can be very negative. Not for mental health professionals, because for mental, for mental health professionals, diagnoses are, 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 are good things because they enable people to identify uh, certain experiences and help people through the, the difficulty and use their healing gifts to 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 help people but when these uh, 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 that when a diagnosis leaks out into society and is starting to used by the media as you know schizophrenia means uh, split personality or dangerous or violence all of which is, is nonsense then it becomes really difficult and the problem is of course once you have that way of describing somebody as soon as they kind of push back about it you'll just say oh, it was part of your condition you know, you've got bipolar disorder. Of course, you, of course, you're not. Of course, you're, you're not going to be called that. You, but that's what you've got, and that's what you are. And so the, the diagnosis becomes almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that it takes over your whole identity. And the more you push against it, the, the more difficult it becomes to find yourself in there. And so my push. One of the one thing I think that religious communities, Christian communities, can do is give people back their names to put to one side the assumptions of, of what a diagnosis may or may not be and just say hello, James or Jennifer or whomsoever you are and, and accept somebody in that way and use a different way of describing people, taking seriously the clinical dimensions of people's experiences, but not allowing that to define uh, who a person is or importantly, how you might respond to a person, uh, who, uh, what you think a person is. So language is important. Mm. One of your uh, interviewees, uh, he's the only one I think you name um, accurately because uh, the other ones are, are kind of um, uh, are given names that you give to them to kind of preserve identity. But this guy, Alan, I think it is, uh, who um, uh, when he got the d diagnosis of schizophrenia was just devastated by that and went home, you know, said to his mother, you know, they're, they're calling me a schizophrenic. This is terrible. And she says, no, you're not a schizophrenic. You're you're a person who has schizophrenia, and that was important. Why is that important? Making that distinction. Uh, well, because well, nobody knows what schizophrenic is. It's just like, it sounds like a Martian or a Glaswegian or it's just like it's just like mm -hmm. a culture group. Uh, and it doesn't make any sense. Uh, to have something is, is not necessarily to, to be it. So but you can have schizophrenia, you can live with it, and some people live well with it, even live well with voices. But as soon as you begin to think that you are it, I, like I am a schizophrenic, then that's, that really becomes all that you, you, are, that you think yourself to be. And the, the thing about Alan that you're talking about is what his first uh, response when he got his diagnosis was that his world shrunk because he thought, I'm a schizophrenic and I can't do anything else. I'll never have a job, I'll never have a future, I'll just have to take medication and then, and then that, that's, that's my life over. 
And what his mum did really was just reminded him that actually he's not as schizophrenic as Alan and there's, there's possibilities for his life, which I think is a good paradigm or model for the way that we should be with everybody, really. Mm. I mean, you know, on one level you could say, well, you know, is this a, a kind of matter of political correctness or whatever? But I mean, your, your concern here is that the description is, uh, it goes goes deep into who that person is. And um, you you make a, a kind of, you draw on, on the work of Clifford Geertz, the, the anthropologist, and, and yeah. um, thick descriptions and thin descriptions. And, you know, that for, for what you're saying is that a lot of the way we describe what people experience is way too thin. That's right. And we need exactly thicker right. descriptions. That's exactly right. right? So, if you say to somebody, you know, uh, you have schizophrenia, it's a biological condition, you take, you take medication for the rest of your life and you're probably going to be able to control your symptoms. That's all probably true. But it's, it's a kind of a narrow and thin way to think about your life. Uh, I think we would be to think about, well, yes, you have this, this very difficult condition, but there are ways in which you can cope with it. There are ways in which you can cope with your voices. There are ways in which you can find employment and friendship and community and love and all of these different things. Like, so that thin description is not untrue, but this thick description offers you a whole new way of thinking about the things that seem so negative, and some of them are negative, but actually there are positives in the midst of it. So thick and thin, I think, is really important. And, you know, the, the thin descriptions obviously cover an awful lot of stuff, uh, including spiritual descriptions, which we'll, 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 we'll come on to uh, a bit later on. But, uh, it, you know, again, um, on this question of, uh, of, of criticism, I mean, you're very keen to say you, you don't want to criticise the professionals here um, and, you know, you, know, you don't want to in, in, indulge in, in psychi psychiatry bashing. Uh, but there's no question that you do uh, level some pretty fundamental criticisms at the, the kind of discipline of, uh, of psychiatry on particularly this issue of description. And you've got a, a section in there about this, um, this medical textbook that, you know, uh, is, is, is very influential. What is it? The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the DSM. Yes. What is it that you, what's your beef with that? What's your problem with that? So the problem with that is that it gives a, a list of symptoms which define, at least from the perspective of the diagnosis psychiatrist, what the condition is. Um, now these are not particularly accurate descriptions in the sense that you, you can have two sets of symptoms which are quite different, but still fall under the same category, which is why, uh, the, the diagnosis change over time and, and you accumulate a, a number of different diagnoses. Um, but but the, the real problem is that um, if you simply assume that you know what a condition is because you know what the particular symptoms of that condition are, then the danger is that you certainly can find the right medication or the right biological treatment for it, but there's a whole realm over here of experience and meaning that's wrapped up in the, these symptoms that you overlook. So you might say, well, <clears throat> somebody, this person has hallucinations, uh, uh, or better, this person hears voices. Hearing voices is part of the, the symptomatology of schizophrenia. So we can use this as a way of diagnosing and understanding schizophrenia. Uh, we'll give this medication which will control the voices. Now that, that seems sensible, except that when you actually engage in conversations with people, you'll find that these voices are actually sometimes deeply meaningful. And, and beyond that, sometimes they're part of a person's social network. And so they may be profoundly negative, but you've also sometimes get very positive voices. And so simply giving medication I, uh, can actually have can actually be less than helpful in the sense that it takes away something that may at certain points be helpful or useful for an individual. But if you have that thicker conversation with somebody, you can begin to see see the significance of that. That uh, if somebody's in deep deep distress with their voices, then it absolutely help. Medication may well be the right thing. But if somebody is, is, is managing their voices and, and working through them, then you have to, to have a conversation with them about uh, 
what they're doing, why they're managing, what the voices mean for that individual. Now, that's, that's not to say that somebody shouldn't take their medication or people, that medication is a bad thing. That's not what I'm saying at all. Like, but I'm just saying there's more to it than simply recognising the symptom and then giving medication for it. And so the danger with, it, with any kind of diagnostic criteria or schema like that is that uh, you can be doing the right thing as you see it, but actually missing important things that are uh, are actually fundamental for, for the healing of the individual in that broader sense, that relational sense. And you clearly think that this is, you know, this is a pretty major problem with the profession. I mean, the book starts with a story uh, the, of a, yeah, uh, a few years ago, I attended a lecture on the positive relationship between religion and mental health uh, given by an eminent professor of psychiatry. He opened the lecture with an intriguing, if somewhat disconcerting statement. I only have 15 minutes uh, to see a patient, and I spend the whole of that time looking at the computer screen, trying to work out the patient's blood levels and checking the efficiency of the patient's meds. Now, that is, that's where your book starts. <laughs> so you, you feel yeah. that this is, you know, this is, this is really a pretty profound problem here. Well, it does start that way, um, and I, I, my the inference is not that all psychiatrists do that, but there's a temptation to do that because if you have a, a a purely biological understanding of mental health challenges, that it's nothing more than uh, something that's going wrong with your your chemicals imbalance or your your your, your, your neurological synapses firing the wrong ways, then you can work out what somebody is going through. Or, uh, by looking at the screen, right? So you can look at the screen, you can see how the blood levels are working, you can see whether the medication is working, and you can see what needs to be done in that way. And you don't necessarily need to take into consideration the personhood or experiences or community of the individual. So you can technically do that if you have that biomedical reductionist way of looking at things. However, there's not many of us that want to be thought of in that way. And actually, in terms of treatment options that gives you a very narrow treatment option your only treatment option there really is to to medicate somebody and to keep their their, their chemical state correct whereas if you looked at a, a thicker way of looking at that then you might see that this individual does need medication but also needs social prescribing needs to be shown where they can go in their community to find uh, 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 to, to deal with their hobbies or to deal with their spirituality or to deal with their friendships and so on and so forth. Or it may be possible to, to, to refer them to somebody else. So alongside a medical prescribing, pharmaceutical prescribing, so this idea of social prescribing, I think is important. So I opened the, the, the book with that simply to make the point that reduction is, is, is dangerous. And, and the rest of the book says, well, we, we, can, we need to take that seriously, looking at the screen, working out bloods and so on and so forth but also take this thicker this way of looking at things equally as seriously. Yeah, you, um, you're reluctant to even to use the language of illness for this. You call them mental health challenges um, as, as opposed to mental illness. Uh, and yet you've got this entire mental health uh, kind of apparatus, certainly in the UK um, and, and many other countries as well, which are allied to hospitals it's you know what 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 is the issue with with calling it mental illness as opposed to mental health challenges yeah well the first thing i would say is that I, I i'm not i'm not kind of uh, i'm not the uh, name police here people can call it whatever they want um, the, the, uh, and I think it's important to do because some people for some people with mental health challenges with issues the, the, the language of illness is the right one, and, and they, they want to use that, and it's, it's appropriate. And, and certainly within a, a medical context, the language of illness may well be, be wholly appropriate. But I'm talking really about uh, what happens in community, what happens in, in particularly within church communities. Whereas it, as soon as you use the language of illness, uh, and it's a cultural thing really, because it's almost impossible to think about health and ill health without first thinking about medicine. Because you know, in a biomedical culture like our own, that's just what you do. Your mind just goes there. So as soon as you use the word mental illness, you begin to think, well, this is something that belongs to the specialist or to the medical profession. And aspects of it clearly do, so that's not, but you're over there. Whereas if you use the language of challenge, 
it's it's a forward movement. It's it's, it's, it's probably that this people are going through difficult experiences. People are having challenges, but challenge can be dealt with or overcome or reframed or shifted in some way. But challenges have a forward movement, which uh, involves all of it. So illness, in that sense, involves medicine. Attempts is to push everything over there and say, well, it's not really our responsibility. Whereas a challenge opens it up to everybody and you have a much broader range of possibilities for intervention and, uh, uh, and ultimately healing. And I mean healing in its broadest sense if we shift the language a little bit. But I would emphasize again that, that you know, and, and it's not me that's, that uh, I'm, I, I took the, the language of mental health challenge from what's happening in consumer groups and what's happening in, 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 in more broadly within the fields. So it's not me that I haven't invented it. And I don't, I don't claim any glory for it. It's just, it's just a helpful term, I think, for us. Um, but I emphasize again that people that should, part of, part of enabling p the autonomy of people with mental health challenges uh, is to allow people to name it by themselves. And that includes, if you want to call it your uh, mental illness, that's absolutely as it should be, but you shouldn't be forced to do so. Okay, yeah. Um, so, you, I mean, <laughs> there's so many fascinating uh, stories in the book and so many kind of fascinating aspects of it. And one of the things that kind of, um, um, as somebody who, who knows very little about this, I, I was particularly fascinated by your um, account of people who hear voices and what that means to them. Um, and hearing voices uh, again in in the kind of popular imagination, you know, this is um, this is serious, you know, crazy, you know, crazy stuff. Um, right. And yet, through your conversations with these people, you draw out um, an amazing complexity of this. Um, yeah. Tell us about some of the some of the the complexity of of hearing voices. No, it is fascinating. I know, I mean, because you're quite right that um, voice hearing um, or, is oftentimes a thing that, that marks somebody out as commu like completely different from everybody else. You know? So you can identify maybe with being depressed or being anxious, but when it comes to voice, it's like, it must be something else. But actually, when you look at the statistics, there's a, a, a significant amount of the non-psychiatric population, something like 5 to 7% of non-psychiatric population, that's people who, who never have any contact with um, the, 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 the health services, who hear voices. So people hear voices all the time. You know, uh, Martin Luther King heard voices, Jesus heard voices, Buddha heard voices, uh, Winston Churchill heard voices. It's not an unusual phenomenon. It's just, it feels that way, but it's actually not. And so you could put it along a continuum where people who have something like schizophrenia certainly have more extreme experiences, but that, they're not, that doesn't set them apart from the rest of the human race in any way. But one of the interesting things about voices that certainly the people I spoke to brought home to, which I didn't realize, is that they're ambiguous. Sometimes voices can be horrendous. They can tell you to do terrible things. They can you know, really destroy your life and destroy the lives of other people. But sometimes they can be quite benign. And sometimes you can actually have both at the same time. You'll, you can have a really horrible voice that's telling you to do terrible things and tell you that you are a terrible person. And then you have uh, uh, friendly voices that say, no, you're not. And they, 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 they kind of get caught in the, 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 the crossfire of these two things. Um, uh, but the point being that the meaningful experiences for the individual, which are very often negative, but not always negative. And it seems to be that the real key is whether or not you're able to manage your voices. So for many people, the voices will always have their voices. Uh, but the, 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 the key is uh, whether they're in distress or whether they can manage it. So the, the key thing for, say, for a, a psychiatrist is, is if somebody's in distress, then they need help. Um, but there may be other times when they're not in distress and actually living reasonably well with the voices, in which case they don't need that to, that, that, that kind of, of help in that way. Um, and the other thing was that I, I found really interesting was the way that voices differed across cultures. And so people in, mm -hmm. uh, I used the example of people in Accra and Ghana and, and or India, uh, had a quite different understanding of, a different experience of voices. So whereas uh, people in the West tend to have very violent and, and difficult voices, 
Um, many people in these contexts didn't have that. They had more benign, what to hear voices of their ancestors and tease them. Or, and certainly sometimes people had unpleasant experiences, but there, there was a, a marked difference. Uh, and one of the differences... Yeah, you, one I mean, you see, of that, you see one of, the, one of, the, one of the, 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 the things that you particularly point to it there is, is that, you know, folks in the West um, don't, they, they don't, they can't identify the voices, whereas folks in Chennai and in India in, and, 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 and Accra and Ghana actually exactly. hear the voices of family, kin, fa you know, fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers, you know, it's those, vo it, they're recognisable family voices, that's very, very that's different, right. isn't it? That's very different, so I mean, if you... And they have a different theory of mind as well, because if you, as, as you and I probably have, have an understanding of the mind as there's been some of this inside your cranium, that, you know, that nothing in there should be there apart from what your thoughts you generate yourself, and then suddenly you've got this stranger's voice coming in here, it's, it's absolutely terrifying. But if you've got an idea of the mind that's, that's open and uh, open to the community and that you actually have ancestors or whatever it is coming in and out under normal circumstances, you have a different theory of mind. And so when these things happen, it's partly because you're the familiar and partly because you've got a different understanding of what the mind is, it's, it's not as terrifying as it is for us. Plus, we, very often people don't frame it in quite the way that we do as, as an interminable illness. It's just part of the way that people are, tend to be kept in community for longer. So therefore, actually, there's quite some really interesting evidence that suggests that you will recover uh, you're more likely to recover from uh, schizophrenia in, in Africa than you are in downtown Los Angeles because you have, you get the more life possibilities. Mm. You know, part of the community, you find that they still have a role, etc. Yeah, I mean, you seem to be saying it also that the you know it, this is partly because of the cultural meaning, the cultural attitude towards schizophrenia in these places um is well it's it's named differently for a start you know um uh but it's also a question of what the problem is seen to be it seemed to be it's maybe some kind of attack a spiritual a witch or a you know a spirit or something like that and that that contribute to the person having less of a sense of stigmatization than they do in the west yeah that's right that's exactly right. And so the way that we frame something like schizophrenia uh, in the West is profoundly negative. And the, and the life opportunities that we give to somebody after, the assumed life opportunity we give to somebody after they've had diagnosis are very, very narrow. So uh, what happens in, in certain other cultures is that you still have other possibilities. So you still have the possibility of being part of a family. You still have the possibility of having a role within society. Whereas the temptation, like with that story of, the, of, of Alan, that, 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 that feeling that your world suddenly closes down in that sense, because we, we, we stigmatise the, the certain conditions in such a way that they have no life possibilities assumed. And so the culture itself becomes pathogenic. So you have a, you have a, a very difficult condition anyway, but then a culture that actually makes it worse because of the way that it responds to it, and where people are stigmatised and alienated and rejected. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a difficult, um, it's a difficult combination for that way. And, and so complex because uh, you tell the story of, of Alice, uh, one of your interviewees, who um, was hearing voices. And it was obviously a problem for her. She was in distress, and there were, you know, some of these. Um, the things that she was told to do, you know, were, were, were terrible. So the doctor, the, the psychiatrist says, okay, you know, let's get rid of this. You know, we, we can, we can um, get rid of this um, problem with, with medication. And she says, can, you know, not all the voices are bad ones. Can we just get rid of the bad ones, please? <laughs> and she, and that, but you know, and that doesn't, you know, all of them go. She, she actually stops hearing voices when she's on yeah. the medication and she's grieving because one of the voices has been very, very close to her. That's right. Yeah. And so her, her first response was loneliness. That, you know, for all of her adult life, she had been surrounded with a cacophony of voices, a lot of them horrible, but actually one that, that was really close to her in that sense. And then suddenly she's got nothing. And because of the, the, 
the, the combination between her, her, her experiences, her behaviour, and the stigma of her condition is she didn't actually have any friends outside. So when our voices went, she was really absolutely on her own because the people who could have been her friends weren't her friends in that sense. And you, you, sometimes you, when you're speaking to people, um, I mean, for her it was, it, was, it was kind of like a really strange sudden stop. But sometimes when you speak to people who are on psychotropic medication, that, that they have a similar experience that the voices are dumbed down. But at the same time, there is that sense of existential loneliness that uh, it doesn't, that space doesn't get filled. It can't, I mean, it's not to say it can't get filled, but it just doesn't get filled because people tend to be alienated um, and isolated, either because they, of, of what they do or because of what people perceive them to be in that sense and that um that sense of loneliness um she she feels like she's lost a community uh you know some something that is actually supportive of her and understands her as a person so one of those one of those voices like uh, one of the voices she called Anne. um when when she goes then she's lonely but and that leads you on to talk about well isn't it tragic that she doesn't find that friendship in the yeah. church, in the Christian community? She doesn't find that level of understanding. And that seems to be your central concern of this book. It's, it's, the, it's the nub of the book, really, is that um, there's a big space there that's, if you like, uh, Jesus-shaped that we don't actually step into. Uh, and, and by that, I mean that... Um, you know, in John's Gospel, uh, Jesus says that uh, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And so friendship becomes the nature of discipleship. Uh, and when it comes to people like Anne or people like Alan, that's what people need. Friendship uh, and openness and acceptance and community. And so the beauty of, of noticing that is that you can begin to see that the church and its practices and its relational practices actually has something quite unique to offer to mental health care. Sometimes the temptation for the church is to say, well, uh, here's psychiatry and psychology, what can we do? We maybe have to do something similar. So we maybe think about counselling, for example. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, it's a good thing. But actually, when we think about it uh, in the light of these people, the people we've been talking about this experience, the very thing that the church is about, which is friendship, acceptance, love, uh, spirituality is the very thing that people need and the very thing that people don't get. And so at least part of what I'd like that book to do is to encourage the church to be confident in that which it has to bring to the table because it's got unique things to bring to the table. It just has to see where it can lay them. Why do you think we are so bad at this <laughs> why, why do we find it so difficult to speak openly and um not not just about our own problems but but actually to to speak to others about theirs and and the the challenges they're facing why why are christians um bad at this along with everybody else if you like well, we're all we're all bad at it, and we're all citizens of the same the same the cities. We all have the same stigmas. We all share the same perceptions and misperceptions of mental health as everybody else does. Uh, and so, the key thing I think is to to recognise that and to recognise that we're not always as good as it is, but we can be better because you can't change anything uh, in, until you notice that it's there. And so, my my plea to the church and my hope for the church is that in beginning to see the things that it's able to do, it can grow in confidence and actually do them. You, you have to have a desire to do it. And that is a, the question is whether or not we have the desire to do that. But assuming that we have the desire to do that, if we have the confidence that in order, the things that we need to do are just the things that everybody else wants, but you know, to be loved and accepted is what everybody wants, then perhaps we can begin to talk about these things. Uh, I, I, I mean, there's lots of theological issues in, the, in there as well in relation to, you know, should Christians experience mental health issues and so on and so forth. But Christians are human, so they will do. But so there's theological issues that need to be worked through, but there's also just that simple opening up of space, safe spaces where you can talk about these things and realise that you're not a lesser person because you live with a mental health challenge. 
one of the, the, the very serious theological problems that um, you identify is the way in which Christians rush to a kind of spiritual explanation for what is going on, and particularly to kind of um, talk of the demonic and so on. Um, how do you, I mean, how do you approach that? Clearly, the New Testament, there's, you know, there's, there's plenty of stuff about Jesus casting out demons from people who seem to have mental health challenges maybe that's how we would understand them today um actually um so have we got a problem fundamentally right there in the new testament itself when it comes to these explanations these descriptions i'm not so sure about the problems in the new testament i think it, the problems may be in, in our uh taking the, the misunderstanding certain things within the new testament so if you look at the, take the issue of the demonic and um, most of the manifestations of the demonic in the gospels are physical so they're, they're not they're not mental or psychological so uh, and we don't normally accuse somebody who has back problems as having uh, been uh, uh, under demonic attack so there's, there's there's that the second thing is and this is in defense of the ds the, the diagnostic and statistical manual is that when you take the descriptions that you find in there and place them against the experiences that you see in second century mediterranean culture they're not the same you know people sometimes say well you know the the, the gerasene demoniac is is, is is the same as somebody who lives with schizophrenia well, we hadn't invented schizophrenia then, so it's, 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 it's quite difficult to see that. And it, I say that deliberately because it, it, it's, it's a very controversial history that that particular uh, condition has. But it also doesn't look like that. I mean, you could maybe argue that uh, there's, there's some you know, echo of uh, multiple personalities or something like that, but it doesn't look like schizophrenia music. So it's not too difficult to, 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 to um, take contemporary understanding and, and point out that actually that's not what's happening because it doesn't even look like that. It just feels as if it should look like that. And I think sometimes we get we get our understanding of the demonic more from Hollywood than we do from Jerusalem in the sense that, you know, the way in which we frame the demonic isn't necessarily the way that you actually see it in the Gospels. Um, but the second dimension to that, and I think this is important, like we, we are very, very often, some people are very often quick to rush to uh, place the label of demonic and some of the most vulnerable people within our society. And, and I just wonder why they don't do the same with politicians and with uh, the, the, the powers uh, that Paul says, uh, not, not specifically politicians, but those who are in power. But Paul says is where the real demonic activity goes on, you know, and we don't really do that when we're just thinking about our politics or our economics or we're thinking about banking or whatever it is. We don't do that, but it's much easier just to, you know, and it, it's because we don't understand it. And if you see something that you don't understand, you go to the, the, the easiest and simplest explanation to, to control it. Mm. I, I think one of the, your, um, your kind of uh, sort of feelings about the thinness of Christian descriptions um, of, uh, of, of, of mental health issues uh, relates to a kind of thinness of our whole experience of the Christian life and, and, and the way we speak about life in relation to God, um, the, the kind of thinness of our, of our liturgy in a way. So you, you, you've, you've got quite a lot of reflection in here about the importance of the Psalms and particularly the Psalms of lament. Why, why is that? Yeah, because, uh, you know, a, a number of people in, in this particular study, but even beyond that, have talked about the way in which they find worship quite difficult and find liturgy quite difficult within charismatic evangelical churches where the emphasis seems to be on happiness. And so uh, happiness it, it can be equated with, with faithfulness. And if you're feeling completely in depth of depression and everybody around you is, is, is articulating themselves in the, the really exciting, happy terms, it can be a really alienating place. Whereas if you think about incorporating, there's nothing wrong with that, everybody likes to be happy, but if you think about incorporating the psalms of lament into your worship, then that changes the dynamics. So there's more psalms of lament than there are any other psalms. So the, the, there's a language there for suffering and loss and, and darkness and depression. Um, and so creating liturgies that include the whole, the experiences of the whole people of God is absolutely, absolutely very biblical. 
you know, the Psalms are full of glory and full of joy and full of happiness, but also full of sadness. And I think creating a liturgy to reflect that uh, is helpful for individuals, but also puts on the table the, the reality of the way that life is and makes it easier to talk about things like depression uh, within your community when you actually incorporate that as part of your formative uh, uh, Christian practice. Yeah, you you tell a story of, um, I think, a friend of yours, another friend of yours, uh, Brian, um, he's called in the book, who um, who um, um, who takes his own life, commits suicide, and his Christian friends are literally speechless, you say. Do you think this is connected with this, this lack of a language that we have ourselves to express our feelings about life, about God, about what's going on inside of us? I think so. I think it, we, we need to practice sadness before we actually encounter sadness in the sense of having a, a basic uh, grammar or lexicon that enables us to articulate things. So if you're constantly uh, 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 practicing the Psalms, for example, then when things go right, at a minimum, you, you have some kind of language there. But the, the, I mean, the other thing that's tied in with that is that when you look at the, one of the things that people often say to people who live with depression is, you know, you, it's, you pull yourself up together, Christians don't get depressed, or uh, you, if you had a little bit more faith, then this wouldn't happen. But when you look at the Christian tradition uh, in relation to that idea of, of absence, because I mean, very often people feel like God's absent. There's many times in scripture where God goes absent. You know, Isaiah talks about God as a God who, who hides. And the psalmist, you know, Psalm 88, darkness is my only companion. So God's clearly not there. Well, even though it's a prayer, he clearly, he's not having that experience. And then Jesus cries from the, the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not like there was an answer that came back. It's just it's left there. So that sense of abandonment is part of our spiritual tradition. It's part of what's, what's happened. It's part of our biblical tradition. Um, and maybe if we talked about that a little bit more and thought through what that meant, when somebody or when yourself hits that space where you, you, you encounter that deep sense of, of depression and, and, and uh, abandonment, then your first thought won't be, oh, that person's lost their faith. The first part might be, well, in scripture it says this. And so we can begin to identify with that darkness as well as identify with the happiness and the joy that goes on in there. So incorporating mm -hmm. that, th th those kind of sad and, and um, I, I, not, I don't mean, I was going to say darker, but I don't mean darker, but those aspects of the faith that are more difficult, if we can incorporate these into our worship practices so that we understand that, then we're much less likely to accuse somebody of being faithless or whatever it is that we do, if we understand the Bible in its fullness. Mm. You um, you draw a distinction between happiness, um, which you know a lot of our churches and uh, and our worship seems to be kind of obsessed with focusing on. You, you draw a distinction between that and joy. What's the, what's the difference for you? What's the what, what's the, uh, the the kind of meaning of, of joy in in Christian terms, which is clearly a gift of the Spirit. Yeah, well, that, that's the difference. So uh, happiness is a passing emotion. So when Paul names the gifts of the Spirit, he does name joy, but he doesn't name happiness. And so, um, you know, James talks about count all joy. What joy really is, at least the way that I, I understand it, is the ability to be helped to hold on to the, the, the promise of Jesus, even in the midst of the darkness that you're difficult that you encounter, because ultimately Jesus is our joy. So it's, it's something that we engage with, but it's not something that is, is determined by our biological structure that way. Whereas happiness comes and goes, joy has endurance in, in that way. And ultimately uh, Jesus is, 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 a, is a, the source of our joy, but has also is the person who is our joy. When you were talking to these these folk, I mean, obviously, there's a range of, of, of people here, um, but they were Christians and, you know, they've experienced great pain, not only from um, their, uh, you know, what, what is going on within their own minds um, and, uh, and lives, but also the reaction of the Christian community. Did you, yeah. did you get the sense that joy was present for them? 
what did joy mean in in the lives of your interviewees so, uh, that's a good question yes I, I think that for the people i spoke to well for some of the people i spoke to uh, jesus was clearly the joy in the sense that um it was the hope that comes with the gospel that enabled them to get through difficult times. But oftentimes they didn't realize that until after the difficult times. So sometimes when they're in the midst of the difficult times, the, the joy of the gospel was completely lost in that sense. So there was that sense of darkness. Uh, and at these points, uh, uh, the way that people tended to articulate it was that I needed other people to hold my joy for me. And so I couldn't hold on to it. But I needed other people to, to hold on to it. And so one woman talked about being in, in worship, saying, I, I couldn't worship, but I need other people to be happy around me. I need other people to, to, to hold my, my happiness and my, my, my hope for me until I can catch up and maybe uh, participate at some point in another. So the, I guess it's, this pushes you back into the, you know, the idea of the body of Christ, that even when it comes to things like joy and happiness and emotions, these are things that we share within the body that we may, we may well not have at, uh, at particular points in time, but somebody will have it for us. And, then, and if they're patient and hold it for us, then we can maybe catch up. You sort of conclude your book with... Um, um, you know, obviously you're pulling things together, but you, you make reference to an essay by Leslie Newbegin from one of his books, uh, uh, The Gospel, I think, in a Pluralist um, Society. Um, and uh, the, the, the chapter is the, the, the congregation as hermeneutic of the gospel. Um, why did you end there? And what's the vision for you? Well, that's, a, that's a good question. Well, the idea is, I mean, obviously, what Newbegin meant was that the place where the gospel is interpreted and, and shone out into the world is through the congregation. So therefore, if the congregation is not shining that gospel into the world, then people are not going to know about it. Uh, and I, I, basically, that's why I, I wanted to, 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 to defend, well, I wanted to finish with two points. One, that it's not complicated. That in order to create a, a community where all of us together are included and accepted and belong, we simply have to treat one another in exactly the same way as you and I might want to be treated. So there, is, there are specialist treatments that are necessary for mental health challenges, but they're also very everyday mundane treatments. And that's, I think that's the space that the church is, is called to, not, not treatments, but ways of being. Um, and from the perspective of the church, uh, when we look at the church, we should see the face of Jesus. We should actually see the person of Jesus at work. And Jesus, who's the friend of sinners and tax collectors and outcasts, is the one who should be seen when we, when we look at the church. And so the challenge to the church is, what do people see, in this case in relation to mental health, what do people see when they look at the church? What do people experience when they look at the church? Do they experience the friendships of Jesus, or do they experience just another piece of society where they're rejected and, 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 and unwelcome? So both of these things are is what I'd like to be to take away. The simplicity of giving the gift of friendship and value and the, the, the missiological significance for the church of being itself and being seen to be itself. Well, John, thanks so much for um, for uh, thinking these thoughts and for you know, challenging us with, uh, with the ideas in this book, uh, Finding Jesus in the Storm. The Spiritual Lives of Christians with Mental Health Challenges, published by Erdmans. Uh, thanks for, for the conversation, um, and thank you for your company today. Join us for another one of these conversations about books, coming up in the fairly near future, I think. Bye. <laughs>